present. Thank you. Okay, very good. So it's a lot of content, like I said. Um, just stop me if you if I'm going too fast. Uh, the bottom line is that I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it board relevant. There is some content here that I use for for resins, internal medicine resin level. Uh, for the medical student level, you don't need to know the all of the interstitial lung disease different differential diagnosis because it's quite complicated and and it's one of those areas that are very subjective in pulmonology. If you ask two pulmonologists to read a CT, they probably both of them they probably have. Um, uh, different opinions, but one of the things that um, I have a friend, of, my best friend is actually, he's a pulmonologist, and um, he told me that he fell in love with this field because unlike nephrology, um, we don't use imaging a lot for diagnostic purposes. As I told you guys when we were talking about acute kidney injury, we use the ultrasound just to make sure there is no obstruction, and that's the end of the story. But if you see a cyst, then you move on to CTs or MRIs, and, and, and that's how you, you're able to, to, to diagnose. Whereas in pulmonology, uh, they have a lot of diagnostic aids. Uh, they not only have the pulmonary function testing, but they also have like more sophisticated things, including the, the newer, um, the high resolution CT scanner. And they're able to group diseases depending on what is the pattern. Do they have like nodules? Do they have reticular involvement? Do they have like honeycombing? Um, so that's, he found, he found this field very exciting. And I asked him, what, what do you dislike about your field? He told me like everybody has a cough and nobody gets better from it. And a lot of the phone calls and a lot of the emails that I get is related to the cough. And the reality is that there's so much you can do for, for cough, for chronic cough. So in other words, like his job is to make sure that he's not missing a malignancy. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of these patients are, they cough, cough, cough. He has limited, limited resources to be able to help him. And that, that was aggravating. And he told me the second thing that's more aggravating in my field is that every time he finds a nodule, he needs to follow it over time very few of those nodules actually become malignant but for him that's actually the highest liability that he can encounter is like like let's say somebody with a pulmonary nodule that fall into the cracks and then you get in trouble from from a malignancy but but anyway it's an interesting pulmonary perspective like i told you the other day my perspective is like my patients don't complain and that's actually that's what i love the most about my patients uh, pulmonary patients do complain and everybody feels short of breath and everybody feels uh, cough but you need to be able to, to, to help the patients. And the more important thing is not to miss something really, really serious. Okay, so chronic cough, what do you guys think the definition of chronic cough is? Yeah, good, very good. So when we talk about chronic pain, I think it's three months, right? Is that what they teach us? That's what they teach in medical school? Yeah, three weeks. So why is this important? Because like some diseases like TB, that there is a cutoff criteria, like if you're coughing, if you're coughing up more than two, more than three weeks, then you need to be, you know, you need to do an additional workup. So in um, non-smoking adults with a normal X-ray, who are not taking an ACE inhibitor, chronic cough is always due to which of the following three conditions? What do you guys think? Let's say you have a patient coming to your office with chronic cough. What are the three conditions that are associated with chronic cough? Asthma, mm -hmm. bronchitis, GERD. GERD, and what else? Bronchitis. And what else? Chronic bronchitis? Post nasal drip syndrome. Post nasal drip syndrome. It's actually one of the most common ones. So we exclude chronic bronchitis and congestive heart failure. Fortunately, chronic bronchitis is not the number one, it's not one of the most common, but it's certainly one of the reasons why people they seek pulmonary doctors. Um, so when you have chronic cough, make sure a patient is not an ACE inhibitor. So the most common etiology is, like I said, probably number one is post-nasal drip syndrome, um, asthma and, and gastroesophageal reflux. Others, we have so many different reasons. Post-infectious is probably one of the very common causes of uh, chronic cough. Um, nowadays, it's evidence-based that we don't give antibiotics for patients with bronchitis because we know that they don't change the course of the disease unless you're dealing with, let's say, whooping cough or you're dealing with an unrecognized bacterial pneumonia. But uh, a patient with uh, presenting with classic URI-like symptoms, they come to you two or three weeks after they're presenting with like a run, they're presenting with like a 
persistent cough, everybody wants antibiotics. We don't give antibiotics to those patients. And I know it's hard to change that kind of practice, but uh, because number one, the patients request it. Number, number two, the doctors, the easier thing is just to prescribe them. And number three is just because we know it's evidence-based that we don't prescribe them. What do you tell the patients? You know, we're gonna give you a little bit of a anti uh, medication. You can give them some codeine. You can give them um, some uh, bronchodilator if they're wheezing. You can just tell the patients to stay warm, to buy a humidifier, and uh, you can even prescribe tesselon, which is a different type of um, uh, centrally acting cough suppressant. And all of the others are over the counter. So the ones that you, you prescribe that are actually prescription are the tesselon, which is uh, um, Benzo, benzonatate, I think is the generic name for that, and uh, the Robitussin AC, which is with choline. And most of the times, patients, they just do fine. And if they're wheezing, you know, you may want to consider giving them a little bit of steroids, either like a short course of a prednisone dose pack, uh, tapering prednisone, or you can also give them a, a, a beta agonist, like a pro-air albuterol to be able to help them. But post-infectious is very common. The, these patients can actually have a cough lasting up to three, two to three months. So, you know, have that in mind when you're, when you're confronted with somebody coming, recovering from a cold. Totally different story if you have a patient with influenza and the patient presents with a cough, like productive cough, like two weeks after influenza. Those patients, they need to be ruled out for what kind of pneumonia? After influenza, we get staph pneumonia. So you don't want to miss that. If you're, if a patient presented with influenza-like symptoms and they're now they're having like a productive cough, you need to do a chest x-ray. You don't want to let go of that patient without rolling it out. Okay, so and, and fortunately the less common cause is an endo, endobronchial lesion. Uh, and this is the one that no pulmonologist or no internal medicine doctor wants to miss. But it's almost impossible because these patients, by definition, they have a normal chest x-ray. And that's the reason why we have to go further in the workup of these patients when, when they don't get better, you know, I would advise that you guys refer those patients for evaluation because that's, there's liability there. Okay, so um, why don't you read this one for me? Go ahead. Uh, the foremost common etiologies of chronic dyspnea, dyspnea lasting more than one month are Cardiomyopathy, deconditioning, interstitial lung disease, COPD, and asthma. I'm asking you for four. So, which one? Just tell me which one you you don't think. Yeah, I'll leave. Actually, deconditioning. But deconditioning can also cause shortness of breath what? Like for heavy patients. Are you saying deconditioning as in like getting out of shape? Just like severely deconditioned patients, when they do a little activity, they complain of shortness of breath, like obese patients and like very sedentary patients. So that's less common than ILD? That's less common, yeah. ILD actually, you know, like shortness of breath, you know, it's, it's very difficult because shortness of breath is a subjective complaint. So anything can cause it, even anxiety or even, even somebody making it up for a secondary gain or, but, you know, if we were if we were to like list the, the top four, I would say probably ILD is not is not common in the real world. It's very common on your boards, and that's the reason why I'm going to cover a lot in, in this talk. But the condition is probably less common. COP is quite common. Asthma is extremely common, and the incidence is actually rising. And cardiomyopathy, these patients definitely they feel short of breath, and that's the reason that's the that's the reason why you guys should be very careful when you get a history as an intern, get a good history and you ask questions about orthopnea, you ask questions about PND, you ask questions about weight gain, like we already talked about what's the difference between solid weight gain and water weight gain, and patients usually, cardiomyopathy patients are usually very well educated about this and they know that they need to adjust the dose of Lasix accordingly. So all those questions are important. Edema, you know, we talked about like evidence of volume overload on exam last time that we met. Okay, so again, these are like, a lot of like like the different types like asthma is probably the most common one COPD followed interstitial lung disease about 14 percent cardiomyopathy upper airway disease psychogenic deconditioning reflux and extra pulmonary causes um, which which ones are extra pulmonary that's yeah psychogenic but extra pulmonary is usually like like neuromuscular syndromes 
um, or some sort of like let's say that, that a patient presents with uh, like a diaphragmatic paralysis like you said or a patient presents with like like they're so heavy like the Pickwickian type of syndrome um, it's like a restrictive lung disease pattern because there's so much fat and so much tissue that they're having an issue it's not necessarily related to the lungs but it's extra pulmonary okay so we have like many different ways of like assessing these patients like PFTs um, spirometry with bronchodilator and we're always assessing response anything greater than 12 percent response is actually indicative of some sort of like uh, reversible reactive airway disease um, we take a look at the lung volumes we take a look at the flow volume loop graphs um, you're gonna get a question on your boards regarding these graphs um, make sure you're familiar with the normal pattern and the pathological pattern I have some examples um, the DLCO ABGs um, and you know like I've never seen in my practice I've never done like I don't even know how to order these muscle pressures inspiratory and expiratory but I'm pretty sure they have a way of doing that um, imaging wise you can you have different different type of thing the chest x-ray CT PE protocol you guys know how how the PE protocol is different than the CT scan of the chest mm -hmm. if you order you're the intern admitting a patient and you order that you wanna you wanna rule out PE how do you write the order no, like for the CT. If you're ordering the CT, what, what do you need to say in the order to rule out pulmonary embolism? No, that's a, that's a different, that's a, that's a VQ scan what you're talking about. It's not with and without. It's with contrast. Yeah, so if you write PE protocol, by definition it's, it's, actually, it's actually with contrast. So yeah, because you, you want to look inside the actual vessel. Exactly you're looking for the actual vessels. Without, without contra is a useless study. If, if contra is a contraindication because of severe allergy or because the patient actually has like, uh, like advanced kidney disease or refuses to get contrast, then you need to order like what you mentioned, the, the VQ scan, ventilation perfusion scan. Um, and the fluoroscopy of the diaphragm to diagnose the patient that you, you share with me, the guy with the paralysis. Uh, there's a test called the six minute walk test. It's just like a stress test for pulmonologists, uh, usually done by respiratory therapies. You can order this test in the inpatient setting and you'll get use useful information um, to differentiate like cardiogenic and like, 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 like pulmonary, like interstitial lung disease or like actual lung disease. These patients get very deconditioned and they desat. Um, cardiac echo and right heart cath, that's probably what Dr. Benzer does all the time. Uh, looking for cardiogenic causes of shortness of breath. Chemistries, you know, you look at the CVC and you expect to see, what do you expect to see on the CVC? Somebody with lung disease? Increased red blood cells. And what do you expect to see in a patient in, in the Chem 7 if you have a patient with lung disease? You expect to see a bicarbonate level that is what, high or low? So if they're hypoxemic, chronically hypoxemic, you expect to see like a post-hypercalmic metabolic alkalosis. But remember, you cannot call it metabolic alkalosis unless you have a blood gas. But let's say like you have in your office, you have a, a heavy person coming in with complaints of sleepiness, like uh, you, you start asking, inquiring about sleep apnea symptoms like headaches, daytime somnolence, um, you look at the body habitus and then you look at the chemistry and you see a, you see a bicarbonate of 30, 32, it's almost guaranteed, like the pretest probability that that person has sleep apnea is pretty high. So I'm just teaching you like ways of thinking about the patient when, when they present. So the blood natriuretic peptide, um, magnesium, CPK, um, aldolase, this is just to rule out like myopathies. Um, uh, some of the serologies just to rule out like, like some of those autoimmune disorders that we talked about the other day when we, when we covered the rheumatology talk. Um, and TFTs, this muscle weakness associated with TFTs. So e EMG and MRI of the brain when it's actually a central or like a neurogenic cause. And uh, exercise ergotomy, I've never seen it, but it's, it's part of the, like the weapons, the diagnostic weapons that we have to be able to deal with these patients. Uh, PFTs, you guys are probably very familiar with this graph from, from, from med school. You need to know the FEV1 and the FBC ratio. That's, that's actually, you don't need to know everything in detail for your boards, but at least you need to be comfortable with the FEV1 and the FBC. Um, do you guys know how PFTs are done? Have you ever seen 
Have you ever seen somebody doing the PFTs? So, you know, we just tell the patient to in inhale, exhale, and then inhale, and then immediately right after they're gonna exhale, and that's how we measure the, the um, expiratory volume in one second. And um, at the end, like after a good six seconds of exhalation, that's when we measure the, the force vital capacity. I'm gonna show you a different graph. And uh, so these are the things that actually I want you to get familiar, like three, four things that you need to know. Is it a good test? If it's a good test, if you always get the same, the same result. And a good technician, a good, a good respiratory technician, they actually ask the patient to do it one, once again, just to confirm. So number one is a good test if it's reproducible. And number two, if they have a good exhalation period of six seconds. Um, and you look at the technician comments regarding patient effort and compliance with some patients, especially in children, it's very difficult to, to obtain a good sample. So the, the immediate conclusion when you look at the PFT report, if you see that the FBC, the FEV uh, over FBC ratio is less than 70, you know that you're dealing with obstruction right away. So like when you have mild obstruction, like defined by FEV one greater, greater than 80%, of predictive, it's almost impossible just to clinically just to ask that question, but that's mild obstruction. And when you have severe or very severe, like when the FEV1 is less than 30% of predicted, that's actually almost consistent with respiratory failure. Um, and you look at the F, uh, FBC when it's less than 80%, then you start thinking about like, oh, man, this, this person may have a combined obstructive and restrictive process when it's less than 80%. And is there any airway reactivity? Like I told you guys, you give a bronchodilator, and if you see an increase of 12% on the FEV or any or 12 of 200 mLs, then you start thinking about like maybe there's a reactive airway process going on as well. So, you guys remember this, this graph? Are you well familiar with this graph? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any questions, or are you, you guys pretty familiar with it? So I'm going to show you, these are actually different, this is a normal individual, this is COPD, this is a patient with a restrictive uh, pattern, neuromuscular pattern, and an obese patient. If you take a look at these three, more or less they look, this, like they look similar. So, and the characteristic is that they actually have, um, the total lung capacity is diminished compared to a normal individual, and then they actually have a residual volume that is also, um, that the residual vo volume is actually normal or increased, but the um, FRC, it's, uh, let's remember with FRC, the functional, functional residual capacity, it's, it's, it's actually, all of, all of three are actually similarly decreased in the restricted pattern. But if they show you a patient with COPD, these patients usually they have an increased total lung capacity because of the uh, inability to exhale. That these patients have like, have you guys ever seen a patient with severe emphysema? You know, or an x-ray with severe emphysema? Do you guys know what they do, what surgeons do to these patients? Do you know what surgeons do to these patients? They actually, they do lobectomies. They take out part of the lung because they're so distended. The, lo the lobes are so, and there's a risk of like actually uh, a spontaneous pneumothorax. So these patients have, have an, that difficulty actually exhaling, like getting rid of the, the excess of volume that they have in their lungs. Okay, so which one of the following conditions can cause a reduced vital capacity? Remember what um, vital capacity is, right? So it's actually the, the sum of everything, like the inspiratory volume and the expiratory volume. And the... the so, which conditions do you guys think can cause it? Makes sense, right? What else? Okay, what else? Obesity. Mm -hmm. What about asthma? I feel like it would be the opposite. Actually, all of them. That's the reason why I put all of them. Actually, all of them can cause uh, decreased um, vital capacity. And you have to think about causes like the etiology coming from the lungs, from the pleural cavity, from the chest wall, and from the muscles. From the lung, if you had a lobectomy or pneumonectomy for whatever reason, if you have like severe atelectasis, any stiff lung, 
there's a condition called lupus lung. Have you guys heard about that? Lupus lung or rheumatoid arthritis lung? They, these patients have like, like uh, stiffness, uh, decreased compliance. Oops. Um, thickening of the pleura or tumor or obstruction in the airway, emphysema. In the pleural cavity, we either have an effusion or a very, very enlarged heart actually compressing into the lungs and, uh, or a tumor, a pleural tumor. Which, which is the most tested uh, tumor in, in the pleura? that you're gonna get on your boards? Yeah, and the exposure is related to what? Asbestos. Asbestos, very good. Okay, so uh, from the chest wall. Okay. All right, from the chest wall I have um, um, anything that's, near, that's either impairing into the mechanics of the, of the inspiration and expiration. It can be either obesity, pregnancy, ascites, uh, or splinting due to pain. Have you guys seen a patient with a refracture? Ever seen or heard of a refracture? It's extremely painful and you, there's no way you can immobilize those patients. So they have like decreased, like they'll, they'll complain of shortness of breath because of the splinting related to pain. Um, and the muscle, again, polyomyelitis or some sort of like myopathy or neuromuscular disease, myasthenia gravis, or your patient, actually a paralyzed diaphragm. Um, Okay, so are you familiar with the DELCO? So this, this basically is the diffusion. What we measure is the diffusion of carbon monoxide in the lungs. And if you, if you think about the physiology of the, um, uh, of the membrane, we have an enormous amount of uh, um, uh, membrane exposure, like from the alveoli to the endothelial surface is approximately like 100 square meters per patient and millions of little capillaries. Actually, this is a beautiful uh, photography. You can actually see the RBCs. Um, but we have like about 500 to 1,000 capillaries per alveolus. So the, we have enough surface contact to be able to have like enough diffusion. If you remember from physiology, um, this is the fixed law of uh, diffusion that is determined by not only the area of the membrane, which I already told you is very generous in, in, in an adult person, but also the diffusion depends on the solubility of the gas, like CO2 and oxygen are highly soluble, and also this, the, the molecular weight of the gas and the difference between the partial pressures. That's where the FIC, um, the FIC uh, formula comes from, and, and, but also accounts for the thickness and this is important that you guys think about the thickness. When you think about your differential, why is the DLCO reduced? Just think about a process in this area, a process in this area, or a process actually increasing the thickness. I'm gonna have some examples for you. So any, any disease that actually results into, into um, um, obliteration of the alveolar capillary interface, like either emphysema or fibrosis or pulmonary vascular disease, like, like a P or pulmonary arterial hypertension, can actually result in a decreased DLCO. So any disease that increases the thickness of the interface, either fibrotic lung diseases or interstitial edema, like pulmonary edema, um, definitely can interfere with the DLCO. And anemia, if they give you a patient that's very anemic, you know, don't let them trick you because that's, that's, a, that's a common cause of a, a, a decreased DLCO. Okay, so the flow volume loops, I want you guys to remember this is the normal pattern. Um, this is the expiration phase and the inspiration phase. They're gonna ask you about an uh, airway, like um, um, actually like a upper way obstruction, a fixed upper airway obstruction is right here on the top left. So there's really nothing coming in and like pretty much nothing coming out. So this graph right here on the right is a typical graph for a patient with uh, intrapulmonary, intrapulmonary obstruction, for instance, somebody with COPD. You can see like compared to the previous like normal flow, there's very little, um, very little they can actually um, get out in the expiratory phase and very little they can actually get in, in the inspiratory phase when you compare to the, to the normal flow uh, graph. And these two on the bottom, this is actually when, they done the, when the obstruction is at the level of the intrathoracic bronchi. Um, if you think about it, they can actually go in the, the, the curve is actually pretty normal in inspiration, but it's very abnormal in the expiration. And on the, on the right, this is the extrathoracic bronchial obstruction. 
and it's actually completely the opposite. There is trouble, like like the patients have trouble, like actually in the inspiration, but it's normal in the expiration. So the bottom line is that this is the likely graph that you're going to get on your boards, and you need to know this because this is very abnormal. This is actually consistent with a fixed upper airway obstruction, and this patient actually, you know, can die any time. Okay, so we're going to talk about obstructive airway diseases. You guys all know that asthma is very common and it's actually growing. It can happen at any time in your life. Um, we're actually, we have more effective therapies. We have less deaths. Like in the 1980s, a lot of people were dying actually from asthma. Now we have like different types of medications um, that we're using. Um, when, I, when I was in med school, actually, we were using a lot of like theophylline and, and old, old school stuff. We, we rarely use those, those medications here in the U.S. because so we have like more and more powerful like short-acting and long-acting beta agonist. And now we even have a monoclonal antibody actually for management of refractory cases. It's actually, it's actually a very, very cool thing that blocks the, um, um, the IgE, IgE receptor. Um, and it's important to know that asthma has significant racial disparities, like Hispanics and African Americans are more prone to have more severe and more mortality associated with asthma. Um, probably you, you all know that asthma is classified in four different, four different um, categories, intermittent, mild, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe persistent. And the treatment recommendations are based upon severity. So, for instance, I have intermittent asthma, and how do I know that? Because I figured out when I was doing exercise, I was coughing like no, like nonstop, and I figured out that when I use my inhaler, I, I pretty much get away with no, the, without the need for any 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 more severe interventions. But when you're interviewing someone for asthma, you need to you need to ask, actually ask them about symptoms, and the symptoms um, not only symptoms but in a week. Like the intermittent asthma is less than less than two per week, mild asthma is more than two days per week, moderate asthma is daily, and severe asthma actually these patients have asthma throughout the day, like nonstop. Um, but we also ask inquire these patients about nocturnal awakenings because asthma is more prom prominent in the evenings. So make sure you always ask the same question: What about at night? And you can you can also define the severity of these patients. Uh, depending on the use of the, the selective um, um, agonist, the beta agonist. If they use it rarely, probably intermittent, like, like I was just telling you in my case. Mild, uh, if you use the inhaler more than twice a week. If you use it daily, it's probably moderate. If you use it severely, um, it's actually multiple times a day. And um, lung function, if, you're gonna, if you get a question about like PFTs, so patients with intermittent asthma, they have normal, normal PFTs between exacerbation. When they have mild asthma, the FEV1 is greater than 80%. You need to memorize this one because they're going to they're gonna ask you that on the board. Uh, moderate, the FEV is greater than 60%. And the severest FEV is less than 60%. Okay? So, okay, very good. All right, why don't you guys answer that question? You want any volunteer to read the question? So there is a little trick here. I, I put actually here and the, uh, oops, okay. Okay, the level of severity, oh, every time I touch, something comes out. How do I get rid of that? Just leave it alone? What are you trying? I just, I want you guys to read this. Uh, this is the trick for that the question. Exit, alert. <laughs> exit? Yeah. Okay, so the level of severity assigned is based upon the single feature of the highest severity category. Just think about like, what is the most severe feature? Because there's so many things, it's symptoms, nocturnal symptoms, how many times you use your inhaler, and whether or not it's interfering with your normal activity. So this person actually, he's, he's looks like he has 
mild or intermittent based on the symptoms when he's playing basketball. But his pulmonary function testing actually the, um, the FEV, FEV1 to FBC ratio is 64%. So which category do you, do you put this patient on? Mild persistent, 64%. Based on symptoms, you, you would say that this probably has mild persistent, but he definitely has a significant reduction, like it's 64%. So this guy probably, I mean, probably a question was made out of like to categorize it in the severe, but he probably has moderate asthma. So the, the teaching point with this question is you need to label it according, according to the most severe symptom in, the, in, in, in a single category. So this person has severe impairment of the, of the of the uh, F, uh, of the PFTs, okay. Question. Yes. Um, so in the previous slide, I said normal between exacerbations. So doesn't that mean that when he's having an exacerbation, it's allowed to be uh, abnormal pulmonary function? Right. So yeah, it's it's more tricky because if you're having an exacerbation, your PFTs are abnormal. But most of these patients, like me, when I did my PFTs, they were completely normal because I wasn't having an exacerbation, but you know, and that's, that's when the history takes place. Like you have these symptoms all the time. Like for me, it's only when I exercise and I always carry my inhaler with me. So wouldn't he be having an exacerbation right now? This guy, definitely. He's, he's definitely, he's telling you something, but he's not congruent with what you assess him for. That's what I'm trying to say. This guy's telling you like, he otherwise has no symptoms. And that's why this is so subjective because some patients feel short of breath with minimal symptoms whereas some patients don't have any symptoms at all, yet they have very abnormal PFTs. So this guy is one example that he has very abnormal PFTs. And that's the reason why you need to categorize him according to the most severe, most severe finding. So this PFT is during the exacerbation? During the, well, I just put an example, like this guy wasn't having, he said that he didn't have any symptoms, but his PFTs were very abnormal. So definitely, definitely he's, he's moderate, at least moderate persistent based on the PFTs. Okay, and there is another classification of asthma based on the lowest level of treatment required to maintain control. So this is how you treat asthma. Basically, if you have mild asthma, you know, if you have intermittent asthma, you just do the albuterol, period. If you have mild asthma, you do low dose of intra, you know, uh, inhaled corticosteroids or as an alternative medication, you actually use chromoline or the, um, um, what's the name of the, the interleukin inhibitors? Um, Singular and um, Montelukast and there's another one. I forget what the name is. So that's how you treat these patients with asthma. This is another way of classifying asthma again, like persistent. If you have persistent, if the patient's already requiring more than just the beta agonist, and they actually they need to be in a long-acting beta agonist like salmeterol or any of the other long actings uh, or if the patient actually requires some 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 medium or some potent dose of inhaled corticosteroids and severe asthma if a patient is getting all the ones that i mentioned plus requiring oral corticosteroids we try to stay away from oral cort corticosteroids for the management of asthma because we all know the side effects from oral corticosteroids but if they're actually getting the monoclonal antibody, the, this, this actually medication is, is relatively new. It's probably been out there like for the last seven years, I would say. And what it does is actually it blocks the, um, the receptor of um, IgE and downregulates um, IgE production. And it's actually FDA approved, not necessarily just for asthma, but it's also for those patients suffering from severe uh, rhinitis that are intolerant to any other th therapy. So, Make sure you guys remember that medicine because you may encounter some doctors using it. Okay, so intermittent asthma, again, like very mild symptoms, you just need uh, no limitations in your activities of daily living, normal PFTs. Management, we all, know, we all know is albuterol, so don't get it wrong on your boards. Mild persistent, again, more symptoms, like probably more than two days per week. You do, this patient, you treat them with the low dose inhaled corticosteroids, 
Which one do you guys know? Which corticosteroid in inhaled corticosteroid steroid do you guys remember? Fluticasone is one. Uh, that's that's actually budesonide. Yeah, that's very expensive. Yeah, but that's another option. But that's more powerful, more potent. So usually a good way to start your patients is with a little bit of QWAR. QWAR comes in 40 and 80 mil micrograms per inhalation, probably like twice a day. So you may want to, if you have a patient that is falling into this criteria, just give them a little bit of QWAR, 40, 40 um, micrograms BID, and that's a good way to start. If the patients are resistant or reluctant to do it, um, you may offer it to them only during the winter months or maybe just like the first six months of the year. Um, and that's when most patients have the symptoms, when they have like seasonal allergies. Um, What's the generic for Q-Var? is beclo, Beclomethasone, yeah. It's actually, it's actually very effective. That's, that's what I do for all my patients when, when I start. And if they really have asthma, they need to get better. If they don't get better, you, you need to figure it out because that's one of the things that some doctors do without doing PFTs. That you say, like, why don't I give you a little bit of a steroid? If you get better, you probably have asthma. You know, you shouldn't do that. And your boards are never going to give you any scenario like that. But in clinical practice, you're going to see some doctors doing that. You should always get PFTs. Okay, moderate persistent asthma. And then, you know, for these patients, we already know that they, they get, like, limitations in the ADLs. And the, the PFTs are very abnormal. Um, and the way you treat these patients is basically with the, the albuterol for the breakthrough shortness of breath and you give them low dose inhaled corticosteroids plus a long acting beta agonist like some natural or there's another one that I can remember and if they're failing that you may want to increase the, the inhaled corticosteroid to medium dose and severe asthma basically you know like I say all the previous and you may want to consider the 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 TNF. Um, I'm sorry, the the monoclonal antibody omalucimab, um, which blocks the IgE receptor. When I was in med school, we we would go to theophylline right away, and then theophylline is associated with increased mortality. Um, those patients they get like all sorts of like arrhythmias because that's. That's like a, that's a sanctin. It's from the caffeine family. So the patients get very anxious and they actually get tremors. And you're already tremors to begin with because you're, you're probably using a lot of albuterol. So these patients, you look at them and they look all nervous, but we rarely, it's falling into favor because the mortality, mortality issue and, and the side effects. Okay, it's important to know that there are, there are some asthma syndromes. Uh, there's some asthma that it, the only manifestation is cough without any shortness of breath or wheezing. Uh, on your boards, they may ask you about the triad, um, uh, the triad of asthma, nasal polyps, and what's the other one? And uh, it's like the NSAID-induced, aspirin-induced um, asthma, when these patients have actually nasal polyps, and what's the other one? I forget what it is. Yeah, I think it's aspirin, you wheeze, and you have nasal polyps. I think that's... Probably, yeah, they, they topic dermatitis, yeah. So um, occupational asthma is quite common in, the, in clinical practice and the um, um, aspergillosis is actually common in clinical practice and that's why you need to get a good, 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 good history. Okay, occupational asthma, there's like over 300 agents that have been reported. So whenever you get to a patient that's actually asking, uh, asking you for testing, allergy testing, just refer to allergy because that's all they do. They go to school for three years um, just to be able to identify and diagnose like different types of allergies. And if you, if you, you can always order it and then it tells you, but I, I feel more comfortable when I encounter this situation, I just tell them, just, tell them, just go see an allergist. Um, it's very different prevalence for a specific population, but occupational asthma, you can see it in the hospital setting for latex induced, or you can actually see it a lot in, 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 in bakeries. And um, other different settings. There's two types. One is called like the occupational asthma with a latency period and these patients usually have like depends on the molecular weight um, usually high molecular weight antigens are associated with IgA mediated and this patient is usually like they have all the package like the at atopic um, tendency like the dermatitis or when they were babies they have atopic dermatitis they have like urticaria all sorts of manifestations related to IgE 
And they also have like the non-IgE mediated, usually they're low molecular weight antigens and they have like a median latency period of about two years before they end up developing the allergy. So when a patient comes to you and is telling me, look, oh, I've been doing this job for a year and it never happened to me before, that, that, that can still be occupational asthma with a latency period. And we have the occupational asthma without latency period, just the day one you started working there, like you develop like asthma-like symptoms and this is actually very easy to diagnose because the patients, the patients, they even know what's going on. Okay, so COPD, heavily tested on your boards. Lots of lots of COPD that you're gonna see in your clinical practice. Um, it's a very costly disease and uh, it has a lot of like direct costs and indirect costs related to treatment of this. The new medications are quite expensive um, and the number of cases have skyrocketed since 1985. Um, like like I say, about 30 million of Americans have, have been diagnosed to this date. And hospitalizations is pretty common. Do you guys know why they get hospitalized? No, actually, the, that's the less common cause, but the most common cause is usually a superimposed infection like pneumonia, and this is an indication to use an antibiotic. Remember I told you guys that we don't use antibiotics for acute bronchitis? We use antibiotics for chronic bronchitis and we use antibiotics for COPD exacerbation. Why? Because this is an evidence-based evidence -based practice. We know that it shortens duration of hospitalization and it actually has a mortality benefit. Do you guys know which antibiotic we use for COPD exacerbations? It's actually very, very safe, very cheap, and it's probably a good way of treating these patients. Ceftriaxone, usually when you have like evidence of like consolidation. Like let's say that you do an x-ray and you see like a distinct pneumonia, then you definitely do ceftriaxone. But if you presume this is a COPD exacerbation, there is a amoxicillin, no, because you will be missing the atypicals. Is it um, It's actually doxycycline. Doxycycline, yeah. My, uh, or you can just do a atypical coverage. But the nice thing about doxycycline is very cheap. It's a 10-day course and the patients are usually, they all, they all respond very well. And that's uh, if they present you with a question on your boards that the patients, all the history and all the, the, the findings are consistent with COPD, the correct answer is to give them antibiotics. Is it prophylaxis? It's, it's just treatment, it's standard of care of um, a COPD exacerbation. You give them antibiotics. Okay? So, um, is the second leading cause of disability behind heart disease. Okay, most patients, have, they either have like a history of smoking uh, on your boards, they may give you this alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It can cause COPD and what else the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can cause? Liver, Liver disease, cirrhosis. And uh, gender is usually males more than females, however, more and more females are smoking, so we're seeing like a, like a gr growing tendency to have more females with this pathology. Um, they have a bronchial hyper-responsiveness, um, atopic features and asthma is another risk factor and um, premature babies are actually at risk of developing COPD. Prematurity is associated with kidney disease and lung disease, believe it or not. Kidney disease, they develop FSGS and, and lung disease, they develop COPD. Okay, so this graph is actually pretty, pretty powerful to advise your patients that they should stop smoking no matter how old they are because there is a benefit. Every time you advise your patient and they do like rehabilitation, um, they actually, they improve the, uh, the actual, the, the performance and the mortality is reduced by, by stopping smoking. But this is actually the normal decline. The top graph is the normal decline in lung function over time. But you can see when the patients have like COPD, there's a pretty steep um, and most patients will have like actually disability category symptoms um, by the age of 60 when they start developing COPD. It's pretty, pretty severe. Okay, so this is the goal classification for COPD. Um, I don't think you need to know it at the medical student level, but uh, for, for uh, staging purposes, you know that severe COPD is uh, categorized by anywhere like a F FEV1, anywhere from 30 to 50, and very severe is is when it's less than 30 or when the patients present with respiratory failure. Um, if you guys end up working in a nursing home setting, you're gonna see more and more patients on ventilators. Before we didn't have that, now we have like 
a lot of patients like living with life-sustaining interventions like dialysis and ventilators and that's why having a nursing home is actually one of the most profitable business in healthcare. If you guys, if you guys are good business people, um, you should open a nursing home because that's where the money is or even rotate into a nursing home. That's actually, I have friends that, that they do that and it's very profitable and they tell me it's very easy money because these patients, they, they're usually there forever or for a long time. Like I think Medicare covers up to 100 days per year and after that the patients they need to start funding but some patients they actually they never leave and they they're just getting their dialysis and, and being on the vent. And if you actually have a vent and you're on dialysis, you cannot go to any dialysis facility. You have to go to only two dialysis units here in Southern California. One is here in Sherman Oaks and the other one is in the, in the San Bernardino County. Because these patients, they need to go to the dialysis treatment with, an, with a respiratory therapist at all times. So you can imagine how costly, it's not just the dialysis, but how costly it is to keep these patients on the ventilator and on the dialysis machine for this long. You know, I cross it out because at, the reality is that there's not such a thing as at risk. If you smoke, you, you're actually, probably you do have some degree of uh, COPD. It's just, it's just that the patients don't have a, enough symptoms to be, to be able to diagnose them in the, in uh, the pulmonary function testing or the patients don't, don't have any clinical symptoms. So COPD, the treatment, um, we have like the medical therapy we're going to cover here, but the other alternative therapies is obviously smoking cessation is imperative, oxygen therapy, pulmonary rehabilitation, and LVRS, um, LVRS, LVRS, resection, um, it's the lovectomy, I forget what it is, it's like lovectomy resection surgery, lung, lung, lung volume resection surgery. I forget what it's called, but basically it's reducing the size of your lungs when the patients are having like s severe symptoms. And lastly, we have lung transplant, but it's obviously some patients, you know, this, this actually carries more morbidity and mortality, but like it's the last resort. Okay, so this is the clinical algorithm. So these two are approved. You know, usually I prefer the one on the left. These are the different stages of COPD, the gold stages of COPD. So if you take a look here, we do, we do all the time we do a, a, an anticholinergic agent like Atrovent, and we do a Suractin um, beta agonist. When the patients are actually failing that, that's when you move to a longer acting. Um, have you ever seen?